For this afternoon's session, um, I would just like to first of all introduce Susan Harris Rimmer from ACFID and Dennis Altman from La Trobe University, who are the co chairs of the, of the ACFID uh, University's linkage partnership. And it's thanks to them that we, that we can have events like this. And in addition, we have Alan Fowler, who is well known and known well from South Africa. But without any further ado, I'll hand over to Susan to chair this session. Correction, I'll hand over to Dennis, who will talk a little bit about the Active Linkages um, Network, and then Susan will chair. Thank you. Well, let me start off with um, very, very warm thanks to a number of people who've made this room possible. Um, particular thanks, obviously, to Patrick, who's done an extraordinary job as conference coordinator, and particular thanks to all the people at AGFID, who basically um, have been behind the network from the beginning, um, and special thanks. I promise you only three special thanks. Um, it's not Oscar night. Special thanks um, to AusAid. AusAid have been uh, willing to back us from the beginning. Um, and the network really grew out of a recognition that, to use a rather crude pun, development studies in Australia is extremely underdeveloped. And the irony is that as Australia is increasing its development assistance, even if perhaps more slowly than we had hoped, we are not simultaneously increasing within our universities the real academic skills that are required. And the great thing about the network is that essentially, and this come, Alan, I think, in his talk, will, will in many ways illuminate what this means. The great thing about the network is that it is a recognition that we need to build ongoing critical dialogue between researchers who are largely but not always university-based and practitioners who are largely but not always based in development organisations and, of course, within AusAid itself. Um, I don't want to go into a long history of the network, but I think that is the crucial point. And at the moment, we are going through a process of consolidation, um, of trying to find a way of making it more institutionally stable uh, and transparent, but equally of making sure that we open up the network to all potential NGO and university partners. Um, and there are some structural problems that we're addressing at the moment, um, and I hope will be resolved very quickly. I hope that if there is a conference again next year, at that point, um, it will be very clear that we have established a network that really is national in scope, um, and equally important, that brings together people who normally do not often meet together. And I want to make two sort of substantive comments. The first is that I think there are two really important things that we need to do. The first is there is in this country, among our universities, and I speak as the university person um, who's co-chair. Susan is, of course, here from AGFID, although she's also an academic. Um, we have a large number of people working in our universities whose work is directly related to many of the key issues in development. But they're not in this room. And one of our failures is to find ways of persuading them to come into this room. And I am going to make a critical comment now about AusAid, and I hope that that line of AusAid staff are all going to take out your pens and note this and will be reported appropriately to Peter Baxter, although I've actually told him this myself. I find it extraordinary that AusAid still likes to use large numbers of overseas consultants rather than put some energy into helping us within Australia develop that expertise. We do not need to hire people from the rich first Atlantic world 
We need to improve and support people to do that work within this country. And quite frankly, historically, AusAid has been deeply lazy and unwilling to look <laughs> beyond the three or four people they already know. Okay. Um, <laughs> The second point I want to make is that one of the things we need to do is to recognise that development is not just about improving GDP. And I want to take an issue that I feel personally deeply and strongly about. At the moment, in several countries, and most notably in Uganda and Nigeria, there are draconian anti-homosexual laws being introduced in Parliament that would actually lead to state-sanctioned executions of people for their sexuality. No development NGO in Australia has taken this up. The Australian government lags far behind the British and the American governments in taking this up. Although we chaired the Chogham meeting last year in Perth, the Prime Minister did not see this, as far as I know, as a crucial issue, even though the eminent persons group in the Commonwealth, which included Justice Michael Kirby, had actually tried to raise the issue. Now, there are many other examples. There are appalling examples, as we all know, of violence as a day-to-day -day occurrence directed against women and transgendered people in many of the countries in which Australia gives assistance. We need to have in our discussions a much greater openness to talking about non-economic development. And in this sense, all I mean by development is a recognition of human dignity and human rights. And too often, the discourse of the development sector is econo economic and seems to assume that everything will be solved if we can just increase economic productivity. And this leads me to the last substantive point I want to make. About a week ago in the conversation, the conversation is a daily um, web-based magazine that comes out of Melbourne in which large numbers of academics write short op-ed pieces. And I highly recommend it to you. You can find it on the web. But very recently, there was a very interesting interview with Andrew Robb. Andrew Robb is the shadow finance minister. Um, and I think, although I have to admit my understandings of the inner workings of the Liberal Party are somewhat limited, um, a major player in the way the Liberal Party is currently constructing policies that, let's face it, are likely to become the policies of the Australian government uh, at this, by this time next year. And in that interview, Andrew Robb showed that he actually has quite a detailed knowledge of both universities and of some of the areas in which Australia does development work. It's an interview everybody in the field should read, and it may well change your... I mean, I, was, I actually developed much greater respect, I want to say, for Andrew Robb reading it, and the extent to which he did understand some of the key issues. But unfortunately, from my point of view, and I think this would be shared by all of us in the network, his view of development is very much about uh, and I will quote the things that he says Australia is good at. Resources and energy, agriculture, education, and medical research. No discussion whatsoever of expanding human capacity, of working with civil society, of dealing with gender inequities, of the link between development and human rights, and of all the things that I think Alan is going to talk to you about. Now, I think there is here a huge political challenge for us all. Absolutely. We, as a sector, bringing together universities and development agencies, need to take on the argument that development is purely about increasing productivity, increasing GDP, increasing affluence. We need to say that, yes, we want to develop these things, but rather than agriculture, we should be talking about food security. Rather than medical research, we should be talking about health and well-being. 
And I would hope very much that as our network grows and expands, and as we build better and better collaborations between the development NGOs and the universities, part of our contribution will be to open up critically and in a deeply human way, the way in which people in Australia understand what development is and understand why it is in Australia's interest to support and foster that sort of development. Um, I need to leave this session early for personal reasons, so I hope I will see many of you around over the next two days. Um, again, thanks to the organisers. Um, this is, I think, the biggest conference we've had now three. Um, it's an enormous triumph, and it's a great pleasure to be able to speak to you just before Alan's address. Thank you, everybody. And could we? I'd like to pay tribute to the other members of the the current steering committee of the of the network, which has really evolved from people who just really, really care and annoy everybody else in the sector about these issues into something much more formalised form of annoying the rest of the sector. But uh, it has been led very ably by Dennis Altman uh, from the Institute of Human Security at La Trobe and uh, La Trobe hosted the very first of these conferences in 2009 on the Millennium Development Goals. And then there's, there's been a, a workshop, a partnership workshop at the University of New South Wales um, hosted by Professors Wee and then there was a, a conference last year at Deakin University hosted by Professor Matthew Clark. And a lot of the people on the steering committee come with enormous amount of effort and personal contribution and I've, I've, ma I've made them sit in the front row to give you a royal wave so you know who they are so you can collar them during the conference and talk about the network. They're Lindsay Ray from World Vision, Pamela Thomas from ANU, Anthony Zwee from UNSW, Joe Crawford from IWDA, there's also Juliet Willits lurking about from UTS up the back, yes, excellent. <laughs> who will also be leading a, a consultation session on our new ethical research uh, work, which is incredibly important. Not only do we need better research, it has to be ethical from the point of view of participatory development. What does that mean? What does research ethics look like from a participatory development uh, background? So all, and, the, and there are other members of the network who, who aren't represented here, but who do an enormous amount of work. And uh, all of this is to say is we want you to be part of this network part of the point of these conferences is to inspire a particular type of practice. And that practice is exemplified by our next speaker, I must say, uh, a self-confessed pracademic. Um, and that's exactly what we want. We want you to all grow up and be like Alan Fowler, essentially. So what he means by pracademic, <laughs> so, so look at him very carefully. And Robert Chambers is a perfect example. Gita Sen is a perfect example. Emily Duranga is a perfect example. And Dennis himself is a perfect example. The pracademic is someone who is an activist and also applies a lot of rigour and evidence to their work. So the idea of trying to combine the best of that fearlessness, which Dennis so beautifully encapsulates towards our four Aussie colleagues, uh, that, that fearlessness, that critique, that rigour, um, that, that desperate desire for evidence over ideology, that is the best of the academic world. And the, the connectedness to the people they are working with, the context, the commitment over a long period of time to, to working in solidarity with people on the ground, that's the best, I think, that, that our NGO community brings. So the merger of those two worlds is what we're after today. And as I say, uh, Alan Fowler is absolutely uh, well, one of the pioneers of this type of person lurking about the planet, trying to help civil society organisations do what they do in a much more reflective and effective way. And I, in, in Robert Chambers' spirit, I thought, for this one, I'm not going to read out his bio. I'm going to ask everybody here what they think of Alan Fowler. Um, so it's a highly participatory introduction. And uh, most of them made unprintable jokes about his name in various ways. I could mess up his name, so I'm too frightened to say his name now. Uh, but they, they all come up with very similar ideas. Alan Fowler's work is very eclectic. So he is driven by lots of different types of theories, complexity theory. He's interested in civic 
driven change. He's interested in a lot of psychological and management theories, which he then is able to coalesce into, a, into a, a, an agenda which is able for, for agencies to put into action. So he's eclectic, but then he coalesces things in a packages things in an in a easily understandable way. So he makes connections. He makes connections between people and between ideas and between theories. He works at a lot of levels, so with very large confederated NGOs, um, but right down to individual practitioners and experts. He uh, is brave. Anyone who works on NGO governance is brave. Uh, and he's, I, I like to see him in that space of the critical friend, and I, I understand Plan International Australia has brought him to Australia for that, that purpose, which I think is extremely enlightened. The idea that you would bring someone to your organisation to give you a healthy critique, that's what we're after. That's what a pracademic should be in that space of the critical friend. Uh, he's also known for his flamboyant fashion sense. That came up a lot. Uh, <laughs> But finally, uh, Alan is known for trying to help the sector address wicked problems. Uh, so the word wicked comes up a lot. So I'll let you decide whether that's a, a moral or an intellectual concept when it comes to, to Alan. May I introduce Alan Fowler? Thank you. Um, after that introduction, I don't know if I need to live up to it or live it down. Um, <laughs> I'll try. You'll have to be the judge of that. Um, this pracademic um, thing um, was told to me about sort of two years ago when I tried to explain to somebody who I was and what I did, etc. And becoming a pracademic has. Um, had a very important moment to it, and that moment I attribute to Robert. He, uh, against all odds in the Institute of Development Studies, persuaded them to take somebody who had no formal degree in anything onto a DPhil program, and I came out the other side a better and richer person. So, Robert, still thank you for that. It needs to be said. Um, when I was uh, reflecting on, on what to present and how to present it, um, I did what is known within my family as a foul-up. <laughs> and a foul-up is something that you should, have, should regret. It means I've left something somewhere where I shouldn't, or I can't find something, or I've said something completely out of turn because I thought your name was Peter and you're actually George, or you know the way it can go. And, and I, was, I realized um, this morning that I'd done a foul-up. Um, by not reading the latest program. <laughs> because the program that I had in mind uh, showed me doing a keynote address tomorrow morning. <laughs> and lo and behold, it says I'm doing it now. <laughs> and so I had to think, and with, with uh, Patrick's help, uh, I managed to to some extent, recraft what I was going to do. My intention was to try and listen to what happened today, to fine tune my presentation, and you know that's the excuse I'm going to give you. Um, but when I thought, now why did I do this particular foul up? Because you know, critical inquiry means you have to reflect back on where have your foul ups come from and where can they take you to next. Um, it, my reflection was that one of the reasons maybe that I wasn't quite quite with it in terms of reading the last program was because all of last week I spent burying an NGO. I was on the advisory board of a Dutch NGO that died at the age of 27. I won't go into all the details except there is a subsidy story lurking somewhere. And the board, at a certain moment, made a bold call to say, unless we so radically change ourselves as to start all over again, we have to basically call closure on this organization. That's a cell phone. <laughs> I don't mind them if they're nice tunes. But I prefer probably you switch them off. Um, and it was quite a salutary experience. We don't quite kn we know how to start organisations, but we don't quite know how to close and bury them. Um, and to some extent, the funeral um, 
is not a sign of a potential future for NGOs, but as I think it's when we're listening to the presentation, if you don't mind, it's something to bear in mind. Um, so what I'm going to try and talk about is spontaneous participation. And I'm going to try and introduce, and I know you're not going to like it, a new acronym. Okay? Um, it's AXOs. Aided Civil Society Organizations. And I'm doing that because we do need a little bit clearer about what parts of civil society are we talking about. And because of the confusion between NGO and CSO that we find in many countries, including in legislations, how do we try and at least talk about a particular segment of a civil society in the country? And the segment that is here and is most concerned about this sort of presentation are those that somehow or the other relate to the international aid system, directly or indirectly. So if I use AXO, I hope you don't mind, but it's a way of trying to say it's not just NGOs. There are many types of civil society that are related to the aid framework and aid system. And that's the universe that I'm going to try and talk about. Okay? Clear so far? If I'm going too fast or too slow, let me know. I'll probably ignore you. Um, <laughs> and for those of you who have been, as I have, on a PowerPoint aversion therapy course, um, I have to tell you how many slides, okay? The answer is 13, all right? And the last one ends with a question for you. Off we go. Spontaneous participation. That is a participation where citizens take action, take agency to change the way things are. That graph, and I use mixed methods, okay? So I have numbers and I have stories, okay? So I'm, I'm trying to cover both my bases. This shows the number of national protests or protests of national significance um, recorded and reported. This does not include local uh, insurrections of tire burning in South Africa, which is where I happen to live, or a lot of the 13,000, is it 130,000 protests that happen in China at local levels? That's not it. This is big stuff that gets reported. Can you notice anything about the graph? Good. Does it remind you of anything that Robert said this morning about what? Acceleration of change. Now, what we're starting to see really around 2010 is a change in both the character and the number of examples of spontaneous participation. And I'll come to that a little bit more in a moment. If we look at the types of spontaneous participation or math activism, civic activism, these are four examples. Does anybody know what the top left example is? <laughs> Speak up loud. The pink chaddies was a major action by, by feminists in India against essentially sexual abuse. And they encouraged all women to send pink underwear, chadis, to a particular politician who had made encouraging Iraq, remarks about basically brutality to women in public who were getting out of turn. A form of spontaneous underwear. <laughs> okay. I can't go any further than that. <laughs> to the right, what is that form of spontaneous participation? Tahrir Square. Tahrir Square, as you probably know, was part of the start of the Arab Spring, etc. 
major, major civic confrontations with violence, etc., not by the instigators, but by the authorities. And the story about that is still being played out. Bottom left, any ideas? The Occupy movement in a lot of, of uh, the developed world, but actually if you go to the website in virtually every country. Is there an Occupy Australia? Okay. Nonviolent, very clearly targeted a particular form of economic development that, that people are less and less happy with. And bottom right, what is that? And it's not my brain cells after two bottles of wine, okay? <laughs> it's actually three bottles of wine, but that's a personal secret. That is the blogosphere. This is a visual representation of what goes on when people blog and how those connections and interactions work. So even though you don't see it on the street, it doesn't mean it's not happening. So when people say, well, you know, where's Occupy now? The answer is everywhere. Ongoing, but less visible. The point I'm trying to make is that the activisms that I'm talking about are of different dimensions, different methodologies, and not always visible. But just because it's not visible doesn't mean it's not there. So the point I try to make is when we're talking about spontaneous participation, we need to be open for all sorts of ways that people are now actually exerting agency. Okay so far? What is driving it? There's an argument that we are reaching a particular moment through a constellation of forces that have not been in play before. Super wicked problems. Super wicked problems have particular characteristics. One of them is which is the person causing the problem is also meant to solve it. They tend not to be very good at that. That the responsibility for, for the cause is spread. It's not in one place, you can't pin it down. It's not governed in one place. There's no one person in control. Climate change and inequality are two examples that are often cited of super wicked problems. There's disillusionment with the current economic model. And that disillusionment is not just related to people who are poor. It's now related to people who thought they were not going to be poor, but are going to be in Western Europe and North America. So there's a certain revisionism going on around whether the market capitalist model actually has got so many dysfunctions that it, that it can't work anymore. Lots of debates, of course. The disenchantment with representative politics. Politics and politicians are one of the most least trusted institutions across the world, which is not always fair, but it is a common view. The World Economic Forum struggled very hard, not sorry, the World Social Forum, to try and work out what an alternative politics would be, and we don't have the answer yet. But the fact that you just can't trust the people who are operating in your name is becoming increasingly common. People are taking politics into their own hands. We're at a moment of, of uncertainties about geoeconomic and geopolitical rebalancing. I live in a continent that is being heavily influenced and rapidly influenced by China, less so by India, but also by Brazil. The emergence of a much more polycentric economic order is around the corner. And there are various estimates of when China will be as rich in purchasing power parity terms as America. There are demographic trends. I apparently am the most lucky person in terms of when I was born. I've managed to create a welfare state that looks going to look after me uh, by having less children to do it with. The one China policy, the one, no, not the one China, the one child in China policy. <laughs> 
there's, a, there's a, obviously a Freudian slip there somewhere. So those who do psychology, please talk to me afterwards. <laughs> the combination of these forces, it is being argued, are leading to a moment of an unprecedented decision point. Now, whether that's true or not, time will tell. But the key question that this poses for AXOs, aided civil society organisations, is what does it mean for them? Where are they going to be if there is or is not a tipping point? So the rest of the presentation tries to give you my take on this and ends with a question. Okay so far? Let's first look at activism 2010 plus. Now the argument is there's nothing new on the sun, under the sun, there's always been activism. And oh, that's true. But there are certain characteristics of activisms that are starting to emerge, shown by that graph, which are quite distinctive, if not necessarily new. The scale at which activism is now being able to operate. If you go onto a website called movement.org and look at how many movements there are in how many countries, we start to see there's something happening at scale. Also, and this is a tricky one, but I think an important one, the activisms that are taking place are not sector bound. And by that I mean you can't simply locate them in the market or in the state or in civil society. The people who are out on the streets come from all walks of life. And we have to, I think, get our heads around the idea that civic agency is everywhere. You can be actively involved in improving corporations from within, not just from without. You can be in a civil society organisation and be very uncivil. The Poko Haram in, in, uh, in, in uh, Nigeria is an example of very uncivil agency in civil society. So we need to try and shift from a sector way of looking at what's going on, saying this belongs to civil society, because citizenship in civic agency is a 24-7 thing. So maybe I go and walk, walk into the Shell building and I work for Shell for eight hours. What am I doing for the other 16? I may think that Shell's pollution, you know, it's unfortunate, but there we are. But then I walk out and where are my kids? In the pollution as well. So this notion that we can understand how societies work through three sectors, I think is not very helpful for some of the problems that we have. A lot of activism is net enabled. It's often youth led, but intergenerational. It's people who are without pensions, who are in their 60s and 70s, who are just aggravators as of youth who have no jobs and no job prospects. It's multi-issue. It's not about one thing, it's about many things. It's often self-initiated and self-propelled. You don't quite know where it's come from, you don't quite know where it's going to, and you can't pin down a particular person to capture or blame. It's often leaderless. One of the stories of, of the Battle of Seattle, when the police were trying to work out where all the activists were, was that they couldn't find the leader. Because you know the police have snatch squads. How many of you have been snatched by a police snatch squad? Any of you? Me neither. Just don't worry. <laughs> I'm not that sort of guy. So, but they try and look for who is the leader and they'll send a group of six police in and grab them and take them out. So the group's leaderless. What the police couldn't work out in the Battle of Seattle, and which they've become much better at if you look at the London riots, is it was all being organised by cell phone. So it was like trying to grab the leader of a swarm of bees. Now we know from the London riots that the police said, don't close down Blackberry, because then we can trace the messages. So, but these movements, these, these, these eruptions are essentially leaderless. In that sense, they're organized without having an organization. They become self-organized and self-propelled. They're internationally contagious. If you look at the symbols that were being used in Russia with, I think, with the pop group Pussy Riots, is that ring a bell? They were the same symbols that were being used in Tahrir Square. 
there is a communication, and call it a contagion, call you what you will, call it viral, that is moving across. And sharing symbols is a very, very important way that Activism 2010 is operating. And Activism 2010 has a very sophisticated repertoire of action, which is called, in some places, Beautiful Trouble. And I'd like to speak a bit more about Beautiful Trouble. If you go onto the website and look for Beautiful Trouble, you will find the Activist's Handbook. And it has a very, very rich repertoire of non-violent public protest, which involves netizens, which may or may not be a familiar term, including digital natives. That's a generation, maybe two or three below me, that are simply so net savvy you know, they just, they are net citizens. That Lots of viral messaging that goes on. Lots of hashtag activisms. Very, very real-time ways, globally, of communicating. There's the whole emergence of unruly politics. Not simply you go to a nice constituency meeting, you listen to a potential particular representative, and then, if you really agree with their point of view, you can go out once in five years and put your name on a piece of paper in a box. It's getting more unruly, it's getting more creative, it's getting more urgent. Lots of tactics, artistic vigils, flash mobs, distributed actions, anyone can act, different principles, target wisely, use the law when it makes sense, lots of different theories. For those of you who are interested in the repertoire, Beautiful Trouble is a good book to get. You can get an e-book, I think, $10. So if I look at all of that, I end up with a proposition towards aided civil society. And my proposition is that AXOs are unable to achieve effective engagement with unbounded activism and are behind the loop of societal change. That's my, I was encouraged by the organizers to have a challenging proposition. I argue that there are four basic obstacles that support that proposition, and I'm going to run through them reasonably quickly. For a start, we've had a very flur a big flurry recently of theories of change. Are any of you doing that? How have you, many of you are doing theories of change at the moment? <laughs> yes, I thought so. We didn't do that five years ago, did we? We're doing it now. And there are very many different theories of change. Most of them not clearly articulated by axos. Because to do so means making a call, and it rewrites so much disruptive stuff inside. Well, I don't agree with that. This comes from a, a publication that asks big international NGOs to get together, so big axos, backsos, big axos, backsos, <laughs> to come together and say, what is your theory of change? And they came up with these five that change, societal change happens because of unintended consequences. If that's the case, you need to create an enabling environment. Others said no, it's to do with access to knowledge and technologies. So that's what we need to do. We need to increase access. Others said, you know, we need to support people with particular ideas and beliefs and values who take ideas forward and can mobilize and engage. If that's the case, then you really need to support the transformers in a society. Others say it's purposeful action. You need to do grassroots mobilization. Others said it's about contestation and negotiation. All of those different theories of change, plus others, live. Um, some of them are closer to what the activisms are about that I've described, and some are further away. A particular starting point, I think, for most AXOs is that there's a value role in being nonpartisan. There are also legal reasons for that that we need to be aware of. But the non-partisan is a good place to be. And lastly, there's a sort of a working proposition, because you've been log-framed, that law, that lin Okay, I do complexity theory, so I'm somewhat biased, okay? <laughs> that li li linear cause and effect is a reliable enough principle to act on. Therefore, futures can be planned and futures are inherently therefore knowable. 
So that's the theory of change, which I don't think quite resonates with what spontaneous activism is about. The political economy of AXOs these days, overly idealized visions and missions, so we can always beat ourselves up because we're not getting there. We do. I mean, we do, if you excuse this idiom, I'm not sure if it's, I don't think this is politically incorrect. We self-flagellate a lot about not actually achieving our vision and our mission, which are so ambitious, and to some extent say that we have a central role as actors in this, that it gets very disheartening if you're not getting closer. But they do mobilize energy, which is a very important point. They mobilize the energy that people need to act. Risk-sensitive governance and relationships. I'm not sure I've ever met a really seriously radical governing body of an AXO. Have you? The whole intermediate-based financing, the intermediation role that AXOs play between those who have more and those who have less, and it could be knowledge, it could be... That intermediation role has created a particular part of the political economy of how you cover your overheads. It's by intermediating. It's by project farming. It's by... Pro how do you cover your costs of intermediating? It's a very structural part of the model of AXOs. Often the resource bases are quite conservative, not particularly radical. Um, Often, I mean, child sponsorship is one example, but there are many, many others where we want to, people want to help change, but not necessarily through violence. So quite conservative ideas about how change happens. Increasing dependence is on official aid, and therefore, in the African phrase, if you'll have your hand in a person's pocket, then you walk where they walk. <laughs> Didn't you know that one? It's, I use it often. And I have two hands. And if I have, anyway, it's, that's why I have a split. That's a, what a pracademic does. You have one hand in the academic pocket and the other one in the aid pocket, which is why I'm schizophrenic. Aversion to being tainted by association. You don't always want to be associated with radical activism. There's a sort of a, yes, we support it. Solidarity, yes, but association, maybe not. Growth-driven metrics. If you're not growing, you must be dying. And a reliance on, and increasingly, again, pointing to Robert's presentation, an increased reliance on this thing called delivery. And your reputation for delivery becomes more and more significant these days. So my suggestion is that the political economy of AXOs doesn't really match very much with spontaneous activism. Relational processes. AXO relations tend to be enchained. We, how often have we talked about the aid chain? very often, I've written about it, that we see a whole set of linkages that have to happen and we start to see connections between those linkages. Often we see firewalls between linkages, so if anything gets hot down the bottom, it doesn't sort of burn anybody further up. So all the contracting, the risk aversion, all this stuff that's going on. And that leads to... Now, did you spot my spelling mistake? Come on, somebody. There's a letter missing. It should be asymmetric accountabilities. My apologies for that. The accountabilities in the A chain are asymmetric. They're not evenly, no matter when we move to the second one, about being partnered. That the accountabilities are skewed towards those who are resource givers rather than those whose lives justify the giving. Um, Actual relations tend to be partnered. We use the partnership word for everything. You need to be a partner with everybody for everything all the time. <laughs> but we know, I mean, I actually only have one partner, and she's my wife. I have acquaintances, I have friends, I have bosom buddies and lifelong pals. But we have used this word partnering in the aid game to obscure the fact that so few of the relationships are truly equal and, multi and mutual so we obscure power. What contemporary activism tries to do is to expose power, make it open and avert, not saying, well, we're all partners. 
formalized, very formalized relationships. Emma used contracts. I think uh, there was a guy who I spoke, I, this is an interview I did from a guy from an international NGO, who, and they were sort of encouraged to start working with social movements. And he started to identify a couple of social movements. He said, you know, we'd really like to help you. We'd really like to support your work. We're really seriously, you know, we think what you're doing is wonderful. And if you can just do A, B, and C, then we can support you. So the person looked at him and said, but that's like trying to put fire in a box. If you want us to do A, B, and C, it's like putting the fire and the energy that we have into a box and snuffing us out. MOUs, agreements? No. Technically selected, a lot of what we do is technically well-founded, technically well underpinned, and works on the idea of complementary competences, competences or comparative advantages of market, state, and civil society in doing things. Very much a market-based view of what's your comparative advantage politically and in terms of micro, micro, micro development work, so technical stuff. And to be honest, although it's, you know, we don't like it maybe very much, AXO relations have tended to become more competitive. Collaboration is desirable, and I know we're working hard at it, a lot of us, but it's actually quite tricky to do. Because you're collaborating on this, and you may be competing on that. So I think the relational process is, again, a bit of an impediment to working with spontaneous participation. What about the practices? What about the way we do what we do? Um, in trying to promote societal change, I think we rely on delivering a practical promise that we strategize and in participatory ways that are pre-planned. Our participation is bounded. Hence, partly my presentation is about unbounded participation. It's not bounded by a project. It's not bounded by a program. It's not bounded by a strategy. It's simply unbounded by life. And a lot of the participation work that we do is bounded. Doesn't play well with spontaneous activism. Most of what we do is non-confrontational by design because we don't want to create conflict, which others will suffer because of our support. There's a moral issue there, an ethical issue, which is quite right. We downplay power relations. We tend to too narrowly focus on the poor at the cost of understanding how the poor also want to be middle class. And if we look at what's been happening in much of the activism, it's been a multi-class endeavor with poor people and rich people and people who are simply, no, I won't use the word that I was going to use because it's obscene, but people who are very, very upset and angry of all walks of life. That we assume that there's always a potential for some form of constructive engagement is that always the case? The example that was given of legislation, which was, is going to probably make homosexuality in a capital offence in Uganda. Can we constructively engage with, with the regime on that? Not always. In terms of some of the um, environmental problems that are coming out of mining, is there an ability to sit around the table always? Maybe not. So I'm not sure if that assumed potential is always present. And another practice is to adopt resite-space approaches allied to capacity development. I think that's a very common theme that we have. We need to use a rights-based approach, and we need to ensure that capacity is there to take forward change in an enduring, sustainable way. Those practices may interface with some bits of activism, but I can't quite see a very strong resonance going across, is my argument. So my conclusion, and you're almost there, those have been counting slides, where are we? Number 12, Dan. So my conclusion is that AXOs are socially useful, but are ill-positioned for and do not have the competences needed to effectively engage with unbounded participation as a process of societal change. And that's the conclusion I would like you, obviously, to challenge. 
So what is open for debate, what I'd like to offer you for this, this session, is a, two questions. Can Axos avoid being a variation on a theme of business as usual? And can they be part of a timely transformation? And if not, can they avoid getting in the way? Over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alan. We have 15 minutes for questions and we have roving microphones. So Oprah over here. Right, 15 minutes. Megan Cooper gets the first question and you all need to be very nice to Megan, who's one of the introduced, one of the organisers of this conference, and missed Robert Chambers telling her how wonderful she was because she was outside organising something. So Robert will tell you again later in person. <laughs> Um, Alan, thank you for your uh, presentation, but before we actually answer this question, I feel I actually want to throw a question back at you because I feel like there's kind of an implicit, well, explicit, you basically speak about the idea of unbounded activism as a positive thing, and that the activism that we've experienced post-2010 is, in, is inherently almost always positive. Definitely complex, you've underlined, but implicitly you seem positive. Could you maybe speak about some of the negative activism? negative, new, or continuing elements of this unbounded activism and spontaneous participation you speak about? Do you want to do this one-on-one? -on -one? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I tried to allude to it a little bit around Proko Haram and uncivil action and uncivil agency. Um, so it's not an unrelenting good. I think the tricky bit that we have with this whole discussion is what time frame is relevant. So if we think that Tahrir Square was you know, basically a, a good event, even though people lost their lives, um, there's lots of disruption. Um, what time frame is relevant to judge whether uncivic agency leads to better civic outcomes in terms of greater democracy, greater inclusion, da-da-da-da-da-da. So I think the answer to the question slightly, and it's not, I don't think, quite a cop-out. It depends on the time frame that's involved. We sit with, a, obviously, a moral dilemma of when is uncivil action for civic purposes justified. So it's a bit of a, a, moral, a moral and philosophical dilemma. And my approach to that at the moment is you have to look at it case by case. I don't think there's any general uh, answer. The extent to which the framing of what I've done is around the wicked problems and all these disaffections, disillusionment, complex problems, the extent to which the activisms are trying to move to a, to a new tipping point of tran timely transformation, then I, my own value judgment would be, yeah, I think that's... Um, but it doesn't mean that business as usual is not going to be the way forward. But whether or not that's going to be a catastrophe for the climate, I don't know. The tricky bit, as I keep saying to myself, is what time frame, Alan, is relevant for this? If it's a tipping point, it could be a tipping point of 30 years against 200 or 300 years of a particular form of political and economic organisation. So 30 years may be quite short. But if you leave the climate change people, they'll say, well, it's going to be four degrees rather than two degrees, and sooner rather than later. So you say, well, you know, we may be, a bit, we may be too late already. So um, I've tried to not cast it purely as all activism is a positive outcome game. Um, and some of the sectorian factionalism that's going on, with, it deeply embedded within society, in all walks of life. It's not simply in civil society. That's where the faith-based organizations are. But those people also work for corporations, or they'll work for the government, or they'll... So, you know, you can't... I think we, 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 we need to be careful not looking at this simply from a sector lens anymore. It's civic agency in all walks of life, expressing itself in a particular way. OK, now we'll take a, a couple of questions at a time. I, ooh, I see lots of hands. I uh, see... Easier questions, please. Yes, uh... easier questions. <laughs> I, I also want to encourage the academics to think about this in terms of what about universities? Where are universities? What spontaneous <coughs> activism and unbounded activism look like for academics? 
what the hell's happened in campus protests. Uh, this gentleman here, and then this lady here, and then Mark. Yeah, my concern is, um, as you rightly said, how can we be, uh, being as academics or practitioners, uh, avoid to become redundant in this whole process? How can you avoid becoming redundant? Yeah. Make because the call. Was, yeah. yeah, make the call, man. What can I say? I mean, <laughs> it, it, I mean, the answer's personal, surely. Uh, Who you work for, what you study, why you study it, what you do. The question not only comes out of, as a, you know, like a, from a personal concern, but also because I see the process where, where you highlighted the issues. These are, um, these are information uh, technology driven uh, processes where there are no leaders and probably there are no intellectual leaders as well. And they are very pragmatic um, and straightforward sort of thing. So we as academics, I mean, I feel like if I graduated in two years, things would have changed quite a lot by then. And so I feel like maybe I'm already redundant uh, after I finish my degree. Oh. <laughs> um, that says more about the academic means. No, no, I won't go there. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. So the next slide is over here, and then. First of all, I would like to say thank you for us Ed, for uh, providing us this great opportunity. Last week, I had a, I did my assignment on like NGO management, and I did the. Uh, uh, read the book from uh, Professor Fellas, right? Did yeah. I pronounce the name correctly? Oh dear, yeah. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so I just can see how um, delighted I am to see you in person. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> okay, thank you so much for this opportunity. So now let's move to the question. Uh, my question is so simple. <laughs> um, as you are a specialist in uh, NGO management, I just want to um, um, ask you that um, as you know that NGO is, um, is not a kind of sustainable, like you can see from uh, a, a many experience in uh, developing countries, so many NGO emerged there, but like for a short period of time they, they died. So from your perspective, what do you think that the future of NGO should be? To should be, uh, yeah to be more sustainable and more um, effective to provide a benefit for people, especially the poor. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. A small question. <laughs> wow. Um, I, to some extent, I, it's also a time, time thing again. I take a somewhat ecological view that different types of organizations that emerge in societies, they have lives, go on, or they don't. Um, so I don't quite see any particular reason why NGOism, as we know it at the moment, should last forever. It has to keep renewing itself to be relevant. And I think my, my concern is that the, 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 the pace of renewal is not fast enough. Um, and that's lots of reasons for that, which I won't go into. You've read the book, you've stayed awake, obviously, so that's <laughs> quite an achievement. Um, so I take a somewhat ecological view that it's not inevitable that any organization needs to be around forever. Um, in terms of the strategies, you see there are a couple. One of the favorites at the moment is moving towards something called social enterprise and social entrepreneurship. That's one strategy that's being used. Um, a very good example of that that, went, that goes back a long time is a Bangladeshi NGO, NGO named BRAC. 25 years, 30, 30 years ago when Abed started BRAC, and he is an accountant by training. He started to look after five years for how do we generate income? And now 70% of their 700 million a year is self-generated. Now, we see a lot of movements now amongst international NGOs or NGOs to look at social enterprise as a potential option. Um, 
There's also a whole other dynamic that's going on of saying, if can we as axos relate now more to mega philanthropies? Because we've got a diversification of the funding terrain. So, and there's also an interesting phenomena which I can't quite get a handle on. I don't quite understand it. Why the World Economic Forum has now got a panel on the future of civil society. And I just wonder what bit of civil society do they have in mind and what is the purpose? So I think there is a lot of, we did it in the millennium, okay? In the, in the, those of you who were around then, we had all these studies around the future of civil society after 2000. Unfortunately, a lot of the stuff that was written then is still valid. So if you really want to get to the future of NGO stuff, start with around the millennium, <laughs> and you won't be far out of date, unfortunately, because the rate of change seems to be quite slow. Um, so I'm not sure if that's a helpful or an unhelpful answer, which I refuse to answer, sort of. Uh, <laughs> I skated that one, I tried to. All right, we'll have Mark Russell and then uh, Professor Sen. Uh, Alan, thank you. Uh, these are just a few quick uh, disjointed reactions to your presentation. I think your, your analysis of AXOs rings true to me, and I was thinking of how AppFit uh, met each of the criteria that you, you spelt out. Um, I think that you overstate, or the analysis overstates, the role of disillusionment with uh, forms of capitalism because if you look at uh, BRICS and the, the, the rising, the accelerating pace of consumerism there and the acceleration of the capitalist model with Chinese characteristics or whatever, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a heavy counterweight to where you know, the Occupy movement um, it, it's vastly larger. Um, I think change happens in some interesting ways because in Burma you can see a military-led controlled process of change where a local civil society that has developed as AXOs in conjunction with, with organisations from the north outside over the last two decades have actually positioned themselves quite well now to, to see a flowering civil society in Burma. Uh, a lot of the models that you, you sort of outlined, but actually it's a, you know, it's, it's something new, it's, it's a research, it's a revival there, and it is along an AXO model. Um, and my final, final reaction is, um, given, given the trends you outline, do you see a countervailing trend around increased authoritarianism and reaction from states and power to try and control uh, these forces that are being unleashed? Okay, so you had two observations and one question. Yes. Okay. Um, let's, well, now the first two were observations and comments, they weren't a question. So let me deal with the question and the comments we'll do offline, okay, if that's all right. Um, I think the trend towards what, the, the language of closing down civic space, which is really the last point you were talking about, is that correct? Um, really started with post 9-11. And it's sort of carried on under various guises since then in counterterrorism legislation and legislation which is vague, vague enough to be Machiavellian in the sense of the government doesn't have to use it, they just have to let you, remind you that it's there. So I think, yes, that's going on. If I look to um, the interesting dynamics and, and dilemmas now in the uh, Africa, the continent I live on, of the Chinese model of, you know, you don't really, autocratic government's fine if it delivers. That's not quite the Brazil thing that's coming into Africa, and it's not quite the Indian thing that's coming in. So, but we've got a very interesting dynamic in the way that the existing leaders in the continent are saying the Chinese model works better for us. It's our self learning, you see. So I'm not sure if I've answered your question, but I, yeah, the, the reality is that there are, you know, but it really started with 9-11, I think, and it's just carried on with refinement since then, sharper in Ethiopia than in some other places. Um, and what's going to be happening now, given the, the natural resources that are being discovered on the African continent, and how that's going to play out as a curse or not, and how transparent it's going to be, 
Yeah, I'm not so sure. Um, so yeah, I th yes, there is. Well, in shrinking civic space is a reaction against. It's a question of how that's done, and whether it's through surveillance mechanisms, which are becoming more sophisticated, um, and legislation. I'd, I'd say, is the citizen under threat generally? Probably generally less. Uh, yes, yes, generally. But you know, that's such a broad. Some places it's much better. If you're talking about Myanmar. Um, been in other places, Ethiopia. So it's a very mixed bag. Um, and your point about disillusionment, nobody overstated, I take that point. Um, I think it's a bit of a time frame issue, the extent to which the inequalities that are attendant to that are going to play themselves out, and the ecolo ecological limits of a global middle class of 400, 4 billion people or 6 billion whatever the project, population projections are. So it's again a time frame issue, I think. Um, thank you. Excellent. Uh, we've got a question from Gita Sen, and then there was a lady right up the back who's going to be the final question before I send you all off for afternoon tea. So, Professor Sen. I would um, completely agree with you about your critique of the access, um, except I mean, I was furiously taking notes as you, as your comments were going up, because I thought it's a right, really nice summing up of something that we've been worrying about for at least two decades. Um, no, the only thing is, I was, you know, I was surprised at your counterpoint, which is the Think Charlie campaign. Now, let me start off by saying I'm entirely in favour of. I supported. Uh, and would support again the picture of these any time. Um, however, um, in India at least, um, those kinds of um, sort of unbounded of enthusiasm, and maybe it's just that I'm a blooming old fogey, um, I don't do this stuff, and to me it seems all too spontaneous, sort of too um, <laughs> inchoate, going nowhere, <laughs> so it could be some combination of my age and sort of incipient Leninism, who knows what. Um, but in India, we used to talk about something else as a counterpoint to the NGOization, which was the community-based organizing. The big difference between the two being that one was dependent on outside funding and the other was not. Um, that, and if you look, at least if you look in India at where some of the biggest sort of successful or semi-successful changes have come from uh, whatever we might broadly think of as civil society, almost all of it has come from the community-based organizing side, whether it's the right to information or the right to food or the transparency or the right to work, all of it is people's movements which have never depended on sort of big sources of funding. People work, put their own money mm. out. Mm. It's a model based more on giving than of being employed in an organization. And we've talked about this for a long time because obviously the sustainability is much greater in the one than the other, et cetera, et cetera, that we, um, that we all know. But having said that, um, and uh, this two things, it seems to me, that can be said for the axos. Um, one is um, that while the community-based organizing model is very good for the kinds of things that one needs to do at local and national levels, it doesn't help terribly when it comes to those processes that are globalized. That is, when one has to do with these things that are cross-boundary and globalized and so on, quite often one needs another kind of organization with another kind of capacity and ability to deal, um, to deal at that level. That's from the, in a sense, I suppose, the somewhat self-serving necessity um, uh, side. And on the other side, there are ways in which um, axos, if they are self-reflexive enough, 
can in fact try and wipe some of their own internal contradictions and tendencies. For example, one way to deal with the fact that you're uh, funded from outside is to fight tooth and nail to make sure that you have a diversity of funding, that you're not dependent on one anybody for funds, which then gives you the possibility of a little bit of playing one off against the other, keeping some levels of autonomy um, in what you do, um, uh, and, um, and so on. And um, the other is to really be aware that the more you have people who have jobs and lives and sort of middle class living dependent on being an employee of an ISO pipeline, the more conservative they're going to become. Um, because their jobs are tied to it, they've got to make sure that the funding keeps coming in, it's insecure funding, so you've got to you know, do all the things that you said. And um, some of the organizations that I know try, that try and deal with it is to really pair down dramatically, to um, really make your um, secretariats lean to um, self-exploit in a bunch of different ways um, uh, that people do. Um, but it's no more self-exploiting than, say, the community-based organizations, which typically are, if one uses that language, far more in that I don't think I should respond to comments I've been, if, unless you really want me to. Um, do you really want me to? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> were they good comments or bad comments? <laughs> well, to some extent, they were comments that worked against each other. Your second didn't quite match the first in terms of being transnational, but then becoming conservative and NGOs and keeping the money flowing. So how you, whether paring it down is the way of doing it, I'm not so sure. What I, what I see as strategies that are being used are sort of various forms of hybridization. If I take the example of AWID, it tries to be an NGO and a social movement at the same time. There are blendings of the organizations are trying to do by dispersing out, uh, trying to see in how far you can actually start to bridge um, in that sort of way. The value, transnational, the value of transnational civil society, whether it's AXOs or other forms, um, they both exist. Um, the, the jargon that's being used at the moment is non-movement movements. Movements that are so fluid, which is what you see in the Middle East, that you can't call them a movement, and they don't want to be called a movement. So even that now is being argued is being undermined by technologies and by other ways of creating a collective transnational consciousness and some form of identity that starts to be beyond simply state that's happening through diaspora financing, through diaspora movements that, so I, I don't disagree with what you've said, but I just think there's a bigger game going on. That's my own take. Um, and because that game is not so visible, we think it's not there. But it is there, at scale. Just in the simple answer, simple diaspora financing. Is it $300 billion a year? Six times more than the international aid. Is it six times more than international aid? Yes, sir. You know, it's just, and it may not be for all development, it may be for consumption, but it's keeping a lot of people alive, more so than international NGOs or food aid. I mean, diaspora financing is significant. And those are networks, and they work autonomously, and they self-organize, but we don't see it, so we think it's not there. And to some extent, we don't want to see it because of the implications of knowing it for what we do, where we have to be a bit more humble. <laughs>